We turn now to Egypt, where President-elect Mohamed Morsi has toured his new office in the presidential palace and is working on forming a new government. Tens of thousands celebrated the results of the historic presidential elections in Cairo's Tahrir Square over the weekend. Muslim Brotherhood candidate Morsi was declared the winner a week after the vote was held. He picked up 13.2 million votes, or 51 percent, beating out former Egyptian Prime Minister Ahmad Shafiq, who received 12.3 million. In his victory address, Morsi vowed to respect Egypt's international obligations as well as human rights at home. I approach all of you on this day we are witnessing, on which I have become, thanks to God and to your will, the President to all Egyptians. And I will treat all Egyptians the same and respect them equally. We will respect agreements and international law, as well as Egyptian commitments and treaties with the rest of the world. We will work to establish the principle of Egyptians and its civil identity, as well as human values, especially freedom and the respect of human rights, the respect of women and family rights, as well as children, and to do away with any discrimination. Expectations are high for the first freely elected president in Egypt, and a website called Morsimeter.com has already been set up to monitor his progress. President Obama called President-elect Morsi and congratulated him following his victory. Speaking Monday, State Department spokesperson Victoria Newland explained what President Obama had said. As the president made clear in his, in his phone call, we want to see President-elect Morsi take steps to advance national unity, to uphold universal values, to respect the rights of all Egyptians, particularly women, minorities, Christians, etc. To talk more about the significance of Morrissey's electoral victory, we're joined now by Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif abdel -Kadus. He is just back from Cairo. We last saw you, Sharif, uh, overlooking Tahrir. Talk about the significance of Morrissey's victory and just who Mohamed Morsi is. Well, it's a, it's a very significant victory. He's the first uh, democratically elected Islamist president in the Arab world, the first civilian president ever in Egypt's history. Uh, and his win really marks uh, a victory over the lingering remnants of Mubarak's regime, uh, old party uh, patronage networks, ex-party officials, uh, media figures, state bureaucrats who really rallied around uh, Ahmed Shafi in a desperate bid uh, to uh, support his presidency and beat the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, but they failed. But uh, Morsi himself, really, his history is not one typical of leading Brotherhood members who had years of uh, imprisonment and sacrifice to the organization. Uh, he graduated from the Faculty of Engineering from Cairo University in 1975. This is at a time, really, when there was a rise in Islamist politics uh, within campuses uh, that was, in fact, encouraged by Anwar al-Sadat to counter the left, which was, uh, which was big on campuses at the time. He then went to study uh, to pursue his Ph.D. in the University of Southern California. Uh, he worked as assistant professor at uh, California State University, Northridge. He has two of his five children are born in the United States, are entitled to U.S. citizenship. And he returned to—and uh, he's fluent in English, of course—and he returned to, the, to Egypt in uh, 1985. And this really marked the beginning of his uh, slow ascent uh, in the organization of the Brotherhood, eventually serving on the Influential uh, Guidance Bureau. Many see his, uh, his position in the Brotherhood as due to his close relationship with Khairat al-Shatir, who is really the group's top financier and leading strategist. And because of his obedience, because of his uh, 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 skill as an organizational man, uh, really, he rose through the ranks uh, of, the, uh, of the organization. In April 2011, he was named the president of the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party. He, uh, well, in 2000, he was elected to parliament, and this really was when his name first uh, started banding around. His, he's really a conservative's conservative uh, within the organization. He has uh, not been afraid of using, uh, injecting religion into uh, a lot of politics during his time as a parliament member, uh, speaking out against movies and music that he deemed too liberal uh, and things of this nature. He also put forward things against uh, uh, corruption that was occurring within the National Democratic Party and so forth. So it remains to be seen uh, how exactly he'll perform. Many see him. He also uh, uh, pledged and has done resigned from the Muslim Brotherhood and resigned from the party uh, once he was elected. So we'll have to see where it goes. Already he has met with Tantawi, 
uh, the head of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and the de facto ruler of Egypt right now. He met with the Supreme Council of Armed Forces and has already uh, backtracked on his earlier criticism of the Military Council, saying uh, how the military has uh, was wise and praised its wisdom in running the transitional period and uh, its uh, transparency and democracy, uh, really going back on uh, what the Military Council has really done, which was uh, a very erratic, erroneous, very flawed transition process, which really, on June 30th, which is when there's supposed to be a handover of power, isn't a real handover of power at all. Ms. Sharif, some people have suggested that this was a vote not so much for the Brotherhood or for Morsi as against the Mubarak regime of, uh, you know, uh, and, and Shafiq was obviously a, a prime minister under Mubarak. Well, there was certainly a, a large member of a large. Uh, there, there was the core of the Brotherhood who obviously voted for for Morsi, but yes, a lot of his support came as an anti-Shafiq vote, as a vote against uh, the former regime. The celebrations in Tahrir Square, I would, I really doubt they would have been uh, that big if Shafiq wasn't the person who lost against Morsi. If it was a revolutionary candidate that lost, I very much doubt there would have been the celebrations in the streets. So it, it marks an important victory over Shafiq and the ruling party regime. However, th what is being handed over on June 30 is, exact, is uh, I think, the essence of the problem. The, as we discussed last week, the uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, minutes after polls closed in the presidential election, submitted a set of constitutional amendments that severely restrict the powers of the president, that uh, the, the main crux of which is that he's not, the president is not the uh, commander of the armed forces. That goes to Tantawi, and that effectively enshrines the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces as a fourth branch of government that's constitutionally separate institution from the presidency and parliament and the judiciary. And this is really the main battle, uh, is against uh, the military council. So what stands right now is for uh, Morsi, there's apparently negotiations for him to name his cabinet and name a prime minister. Supposedly, they're considering Mohammed al baradai as prime minister. Uh, but Baradai himself has said that he would not accept a position like that a couple of weeks ago because uh, Baradai himself refused to run for president in January because, uh, under the rule of the military council, he saw it as a flawed transition. And then announced he wouldn't vote. And then, yes, boycotted the vote himself. So I doubt that he would accept a position as prime minister, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Morsi has pledged uh, to name three vice presidents, one of which will be a uh, Coptic Christian uh, of Egypt's minority. Three vice presidents? Is that well, we've never had a vice president in Egypt until uh, January of 2011, when Mubarak appointed Omar Suleiman as his first and only vice president. So uh, these are positions all being negotiated. Sharif, many of Mohamed Morsi's critics have expressed concern about his affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood. This is is Abdelmanim Abdul Fatou, who himself resigned from the Brotherhood when he decided to run in the presidential election. We need to move forward. I'm calling upon the national political forces to obligate President Mohamed Morsi to achieve his commitments. He vows to achieve them, and I'm congratulating him on his victory. I'm calling upon the forces to push him to fulfill his commitments, to convert it from just promises into facts. We do not expect only televised speeches from him, but we need him to fulfill his commitments. Firstly, he should be an independent president with no links to the Muslim Brotherhood and to the Freedom and Justice Party. That's Abdelmanim Abu Fatouh, your response. He was with the Brotherhood, but he quit. He was a longtime member of the Muslim Brotherhood, a leading member, in fact, one that helped uh, rise uh, the, the, the resurgence of the Brotherhood uh, in, on campuses in the 70s and early 80s. He uh, left the group last year when he decided to run for president, going back on his pledge. And, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood pledged not to field a presidential candidate. He has uh, since then come into uh, confrontation with the leadership of the Brotherhood, primarily Khairat al-Shatr, and has been seen as uh, really a candidate, a presidential candidate that was in the spirit of the revolution, supported by a lot of revolutionaries had a, a campaign which was really a rainbow coalition that had uh, liberal seculars to ultra-conservative Salafis, ultimately came, a, came fourth in the presidential race in the first round. But he's been critical of the Brotherhood because uh, they have really, over the transitional period, left many of the revolutionary principles that people fought and died for and sided with the military council on many issues uh, in pursuit of their own interests. And uh, we've already seen kind of this backtracking now. There's uh, four very important—there's a sit-in that's continuing in Tahrir right now 
and the Brotherhood is calling for four things, one of which is the annulment of the constitutional amendments that uh, take away power from the presidency, also uh, uh, reinstating parliament, which was dissolved just a couple of weeks ago, where the Muslim Brotherhood really had a plurality of votes in that body, uh, to annul a military a, a judicial decree that gives the military widespread uh, powers of arrest and detention. So, uh, the Brotherhood is holding the sit-in. It's still there, but there's conflicting reports from senior Brotherhood members who are kind of also negotiating and backtracking. So, uh, we'll have to see where that goes. There's also an, a bunch of court cases that are in play right now. But right when we're talking right now, there's one that may be ruled today, which would annul that uh, very pernicious uh, decree by the Ministry of Justice to really restore elements of martial law to Egypt and allow the military and military intelligence to arrest and detain uh, citizens. There's also another very important court case, which is uh, will decide whether parliament can be reinstated. So what what happens right now is that some element of executive power will be handed over to Mohammed Morsi at the end of the month. There's uh, negotiations around the Constituent Assembly, which will draft the country's new constitution, which is really the crux of, uh, of the new Egypt. And the military has uh, reinstated control over this process. It can veto any element of the constitution doesn't like before it gets drafted. If it doesn't agree, if there's any, quote-unquote, obstacles that this Constituent Assembly encounters, then it can dissolve that entire body appoint its own constituent assembly, which will write the constitution within three months. After that, there's a referendum on the constitution, and we, we don't know, but we may also re-elect the president as well after a new constitution. So Mohamed Morsi may only be an interim leader. In addition to the constraints that you've outlined um, on presidential power, there have been reports in the media that SCAF, that the military will retain control of all of the key ministries, interior, foreign affairs, uh, justice and defense. Well, the, the, Mohamed Morsi has the right to name all the ministers, and that's what uh, the Supreme Council has said. But no one is under any illusion that really these key ministries, which they are called the sovereign ministries in Arabic, will be uh, appointed really by uh, the, the military council. There's no way, I, I believe, Morsi would name anyone else other than uh, uh, Tantawi as defense minister, or really name someone who is a civil, civilian reformist uh, over the interior ministry. So, uh, you know, we'll We'll have to see where, where that goes. And could the SCAF, the armed forces, just call for a new election in four months and Mohamed Morsi would be out? Yes. The SCAF has made up the rules as it went along throughout this transitional period. Uh, this has been a flawed process from the beginning. And really, uh, the biggest failure by many of the civilian political forces was to accept, back in March of 2011, the military to oversee what was a, a transition to a civilian democracy. And where is Ahmed Shafiq? Ahmed Shafi uh, apparently flew to the United Arab Emirates today with his all of his children, some of his grandchildren, just hours after the general prosecutor opened up charges of corruption against him. Wow. Well, Sharif Abdokadus, I want to thank you for being with us. It's so great to have you back here in New York. I know you're.